I'm Siraj Raval. Good to be here in Holland from beautiful San Francisco, California. Yeah, so I'm a YouTuber. I already got introduced. What else can I say? I like long walks on the beach. No, no, okay, anyway. This isn't about me. This is about the topic. And the topic is, how do we prevent an AI apocalypse? So put your serious hats on because this is a serious talk with some humor because that's just how we do it. So before, we, before I talk about the implications of AI and the morality and all that good stuff, I want to start off by talking about where we are right now. Okay, so let's talk about where we are. And so software has only been around for, what is it, like 50 or 60 years? Comparatively, like compared to all the other sciences, that's pretty young. So it's been around for like 50 years now. And I like to split it up into three different phases, okay? So in the first phase, uh, it was all about rule-based intelligence, right? So everything was a bunch of if-then statements. So if this happens, then do this. If this happens, then do this. Who here has ever played the game Pong? Okay, that's a great example, a lot of people, that's a great example of rule-based intelligence. If the ball moves down, move the paddle down. If the ball moves up, move the paddle up. So that was our first iteration of software. Simple games, direct translation. So for every word in English, let's say you want to translate it to French, just take the dictionary and just literally translate that word. Don't put it into the context of everything else, just direct translation word for word. Obviously it's a bad translation because language is complicated, but hey, it was our first iteration, okay? That was the first phase. And so the next phase, the middle phase, was all about using what's called heuristics. And heuristics means educated guesses. So instead of telling our machines exactly what to do, we gave it options. We gave it a set of options, and then we asked it to find the best option. So one example of this would be Translation, yet again. Instead of doing direct translation word for word, we would have it predict the next likely word. Or let's say we were trying to get it to go from like point A to point B. It would try out all the possible paths and then pick the best path, right? So you see the idea of giving it options and then having it make educated guesses? That was the, that was the middle phase, and that was around the early 80s to the early 90s. And now we are in the final phase the final phase of software development, and that is the learning phase. Instead of telling our machines any kind of rules, we give it an objective, we give it a goal, and then we give it some data, and we say, here's the goal, learn the steps you need to get there. Okay, so a good example of this, one of my favorite examples, is image classification. That's a very popular example, right? We wanted to make an app that learns to recognize dogs in photos, right? So the, the traditional way of doing this would be like, okay, as a, as a software engineer, how am I going to do this? Well, to detect dogs, I'm going to need to write a function that detects ears, and then another function that detects, you know, the shape of your teeth, and then the color of your fur. But the problem with that approach is that there are so many different types of dogs out there, right? There's thousands of breeds. So there's no way you could write a million rules, right? There would be millions of rules. So a better way of doing this is the learning approach. Instead of saying, here are all the things that make up a dog, we say, here's the goal. The goal is to detect any kind of dog. And here's the data. Millions or sometimes even thousands of pictures of dogs learn what it means to be a dog. Learn the essence of what a dog is. And it would learn all the things it needs to detect a dog. Right? And so that's a, that's a simple example, but there's so many cool things we could do. I mean, I talk about this all day, 24-7. There, there are so many things we could do. Drug discovery, new scientific methods that we've never even thought about. We can generate art and music. I mean, it, it could just amplify every good thing we have about ourselves as humans. 100x, 1,000x, self-driving cars, I could go on and on. But that's where we are right now. Okay, so th that was a little bit of a, a refresher on, on where we are. Okay, so now that I've talked about that, let's talk about what evil AI is. And so I've segmented the disaster scenarios into two separate scenarios. One of them is annihilation. And this is the one that most people are familiar with. And the, the, the other one, which is, which is equally nefarious, is manipulation. So let's talk about annihilation. Who here has seen Terminator? Yeah, okay, so, God damn it, Hollywood. But okay, so everybody's seen Terminator, and so this is like, what people think about when they think of AI, because that's just, I mean, I mean, that kind of story just sells, right? But the idea is that we would create AI, it would become self-aware, and then it would kill us all. That's actually, yes, that is a possibility. But he, so here's the possibility that most people think about when they think about this. 
The main possibility is we have some kind of evil corporation like you know, Skynet or some government or something, and they decide to kill all humans because the, the humans themselves are evil. And then the AI has control of the weapon systems, and then it kills our entire species. But here's a more realistic scenario, and this is one that most people don't think about. So a more realistic scenario would be that it, let's say a good person wants to solve global warming, and they say, OK, AI, I want you to solve global warming. Here is all this meteorological data. Find the steps you need to solve global warming. And what happens is the AI decides to destroy us all, as, because that's the most efficient way that it decides to optimize for its objective, solving global warming. It's not that the, the, the good person who implemented it was evil. It was just a side effect of the AI. He, we didn't properly embed our values into these systems. So there are a couple ways that this could happen. It's a real possibility, and we all need to be thinking about this. So that's the first way. The second way is manipulation. By the way, annihilation, I mean, this, this stuff is already happening. There are already um, governments that are using AI for warfare. So it's not like it's some point in the future. It's already happening. Another way is manipulation, which is also happening right now. Who, who here's heard of fake news, right? Fake news is a real thing, no pun intended. Fake news is a real thing. And I've, I've taught people how to, not specifically to make fake news, but how to do this generative modeling. That, it's called generative modeling and machine learning, where we take some data. So we have some data set. Let's say like 1,000 Wikipedia articles. We train our model on this data, and then we can generate new Wikipedia articles that look like the real thing. They're almost indistinguishable from the real thing, except they're fake. And we can do this for any kind of data, whether it's text, images, video. I mean, check out this picture. This is a real thing. Okay, the idea is that you could generate video in the form of your favorite politician, hopefully it's not Donald Trump, but your favorite politician, and it would, that, that politician would then say exactly what you want, and it would be indistinguishable from the real thing. That's pretty scary, right? So the line between what's real and what's fake will get blurrier and blurrier over time. So we're witnessing the rise of this AI weaponized propaganda machine. And all of us are being manipulated to some degree. And there are a few people in control of this. And the people who are in control of these centralized systems are controlling what we think. They're able to influence human behavior for, like for large swaths of the human population just by tweaking algorithms. Right? Facebook's news feed, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I use it. And raise your hand if you use it too. It's probably almost every person in this room uses it. Oh, actually, not that many people. Oh, But I use Facebook's news feed. And yeah, that, I mean, that's a great example of manipulative AI, right? It manipulates us into believing what it wants us to believe. It's optimized for attention, so it's, it's supposed to keep you on the page, but it should be optimized for your time well spent, so it, it benefits you in some way. That's a separate topic. What should we be optimizing our AI for? But it's definitely already manipulating us. This will get better over time, uh, and it's, it's a superpower. AI is a superpower, okay? Adolf Hitler built a propaganda machine. Okay, and this was like 60 years ago, and he was able to convince large amounts of good people that it was okay to exterminate a certain Jewish people. Imagine if Hitler had access to superintelligence. We would be living in a nightmarish reality. So we have to be really careful about who gets access to this technology and what they decide to do with it. It's not always the AI that's going to be evil, it's the people, right? So we need to be thinking about this. So enough about the evil AI. Let's talk about the good stuff. Now, no one talks about the good stuff, and they should, because in the worst case, it creates a dystopia, right? It, it kills us all, right? That's in the worst case. But in the best case, it solves literally every single problem that we could ever imagine. A, a universal problem solver, where you could just say, solve for X, and X is global warming, disease, famine, poverty, War, you know, anything, any huge intractable problem, any multivariate problem, it could solve. The problems that would take us as an entire species, as a, as a collective, maybe 10,000 years, it could solve in a few seconds because it's able to analyze all the data that we're generating every day, every month, every week, every year, right? More data than any human could get insights from. It would be able to do that. So the upside is huge. It, would, it could end suffering as we know it. 
It could end suffering. It could, it could generate entire new realities. It could generate entire new realities, and then you could live out your wildest fantasies. You want to be in Star Wars? Go for it. You could generate yourself into that world, full five senses immersion. Oh, we don't know how to solve that? Ask it to solve it. Oh, and now you got full five sense immersion using this technique that you would have never thought of before. And another scenario is that we evolve. So it's not like it's some separate entity and it's, it's us. We become one in the same thing. And in a way, we're kind of already doing that. We're building this god. The internet, in a way, is a nervous system. And then all these sensors, the internet of things, are its not five senses, but thousands of senses. Consider it a collective human machine intelligence. And there are a couple of companies like Facebook and you know, people like Elon that are working on brain-computer interface technology. So instead of using our phones where we're just tapping you know, whatever, uh, we would just have a thought and then connect that thought to the, to the collective human machine intelligence. Whether it's an artistic thought or a scientific thought, you could just amplify it a thousandfold and you would become a, a world-class expert in whatever you want. Right now, it takes 10,000 hours of human training time to do that, but we can offload that training time to machines. The potential upside is huge. So now to the real meat of the problem. How do we build safe AI? So yeah. I'll talk about these two guys in a second. But I want to first talk about an assumption that we will solve AI eventually. Eventually, this will happen. Because it's been improving. I mean, if, if, we, if you look at the field, if you read papers, if, you, if you're keeping up with the field, we are breaking the state of the art in any number of subfields of computer science almost every other day. We are surpassing human uh, capabilities in a bunch of tasks. Cla image classification is a good one, but a bunch of tasks. Vision, speech, all the things that we're good at, we are surpassing that day by day by day. So eventually, maybe it's not in five years, maybe it's not even in 100 years, but eventually we are going to solve this, uh, assuming that there's no catastrophic event that wipes half of us out. So the, then the question is, can we contain it? So this is actually a very popular uh, AI safety thought experiment. Can we contain it? Nick Bostrom and a bunch of philosophers talk about this. But my answer is no. No, we can't contain it. The idea is that you would put an AI in a box. The box would be like a computer or some kind of server or something. And then you would just disconnect it from the internet. Uh, and the idea would be like, OK, because it's not connected to the internet, it's not going to become a god. The problem is, is that it would learn how to get connected to the internet, whether through some means that you would have never thought, it would find a way. And even if it didn't, another AI researcher would let his loose or her, or her AI loose because they just want to see what happens. We're a very curious bunch. If we see a red button, we're going to press it, right? So eventually, it's going to be let loose on the internet. So we can't contain it. So then the question is, can we embed it with our values? And so that's why I have these two guys up here, so because they're two of my favorite philosophers, but they're also on uh, polar opposite ends of the morality spectrum. So on one hand, you have Nietzsche. And Nietzsche said that morality is subjective, that good and evil are these human-made constructs, and they depend on the person. Each person defines it for themselves. But on the polar opposite end, Kant said that morality is objective, that there is some universal good and evil that we are all striving to go towards, but it is, it is greater than all of us. So we can't even collectively decide what our values are. We are still debating what our values are. So how are we supposed to embed AI with our collective values if we can't even decide what our values are? So it's ultimately, it comes down to who is building this technology. They are going to embed their values into this technology. We are humans. We have our biases. And when we build our technology, those biases will go into that technology. And it's not like this is going to happen in the future. The battle has already begun. I have three examples up here. The first one is security. So when it comes to AI and security, the viruses will start to use AI more and more to try to find the holes in security systems that it can best uh, exploit. But at the same time, the AI that's used to, de to defend against viruses will learn what it needs to detect where those exploits are. Another example would be fake news. The AI that's used to generate fake news will get better and better. But at the same time, the AI that's used to, de to detect what's real and what's fake will get better and better as well. So it's this constant battle on both sides. And AI is going to get better and better on both sides. 
So we are in the midst of a new Cold War. This is a new arms race. AI is the nuclear power of our time. And any entity, any corporation, any institution that wants to use this for their goal will do so. It is a superpower. It will amplify whatever your objective is. So I'm sure that a cool place like Holland, w the government of Holland would use AI to, I don't know, make healthcare more personalized for its citizens. But then a government like North Korea would use AI to speed up it, the, the development of its intercontinental ballistic missiles. So we have to be very careful about who gets access to this technology. And one great example of a runway AI, of an AI that even the creators don't understand how it works, is Facebook's newsfeed. They optimize it for attention, and now it's finding all these metrics to optimize for attention that even the creators don't understand like, what these metrics are. It just learned for itself. So the battle has already begun. And so the answer is actually very, very, very simple to all of these problems. We have to democratize AI. And here's a great quote from my boy Elon. He actually quoted this other dude, Lord Acton, but like Elon, I'm just going to. So the quote is, freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. What does that mean? It means that if we have any one entity that has hold of this superpower, they will abuse that power. And the way to prevent that is to spread this superpower to as many people as possible. And the idea is that the will of the collective will override any single bad actor. We will build systems collectively to prevent any kind of cataclysmic scenario if everybody has access to this power. There are only a few corporations and, and groups that are working on this right now. OpenAI is one, Miri, Google to some extent, Good AI. But we need more. So everybody in this audience, everybody who's watching, I'm talking to you individually, it is your responsibility to educate yourself on how AI works, at least at a high level. We all need to understand, at least at a high level, how this stuff works, right? Self-driving cars are around the corner, and we're going to have to learn to trust that technology, just like we've learned to trust the rule-based systems of the past, traffic lights, you know, very basic systems all around us. We've learned to trust machines instead of people, because we realized that the machines were better at doing the job. So we need to learn to trust these learning machines. And the only way to do that is if you understand how they work. So we need to educate ourselves. We need to learn how this technology works. We need to spread AI awareness. Whatever field you're in, sales, marketing, programming, whatever field you're in, you need to understand at a high level how AI works. We need to make it a part of mainstream culture, something as mainstream as Kim Kardashian. And if we do that, then we won't just survive as a society. We will thrive. And so I'm going to end this with a short rap. Uh, it's a 10-second rap, and it is a parody of Kanye West's Stronger, but it's called Smarter. So here, here, there's no music. Here's, a, here's, a, here's, here's how it goes. I, I, I got to read papers to try and make me smarter. I train my models in the cloud now, because my laptop takes longer. I parse through data like a boss now. Back then, my code was wronger. So subscribe if you want to learn now, and let's spread this AI power. Thank you, everybody. Watch out, Kanye. Watch out, Kanye. Watch out, Kanye.